in. Hello and welcome to the Leaders' Council podcast with me, Joshua Jackson. This podcast, just like the Leaders' Council itself, is all about recognising and celebrating the people who keep this great country running. We exist to give leaders a voice outside of their own organisations and to support them in the same way they support their staff every single day of the week. If you're in a leadership position yourself and would like to have your voice heard on the national stage, please go to leaderscouncil.co.uk forward slash apply. Each week on this programme, I'm joined by a different leadership figure from the world of business, education, politics, sport, or even from local communities in the aim of truly discovering who those people are that get up every morning and make this country work. We get their take on the current economic and political landscape of the UK and discuss everything from supply chain headaches to good quality design and of course, the success and the innovation that makes it all worthwhile in the end. On today's program, I'm delighted to be joined by Keith Myers, who is the founder and co-director alongside his wife of the Myers Touch. And the Myers Touch specialises in the design of luxury kitchens, creating more than just a, a cooking environment, it's a place to enjoy and a place to really bring a home together. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Keith onto the show. Keith, hello. Hi, hi. Uh, thank you for, for having us today. No, that's an absolute pleasure. It's always great to have people, as I say, from, from different areas of business um, appearing on the podcast, um, you know, getting people's takes on on the highs and lows of the last 18 months and, um, you know, how things have been going. And, you know, it would be remiss of us not to, to touch on on COVID and uh, business interruption, really. And, um, you know, obviously, given your particular specialisms, uh, how has that been? Well, I think, I mean, I think for all for, for all people in business, when we, when we hit kind of March um, last year, uh, all of us were kind of probably uh, shocked. Uh, uh, it's just kind of probably the biggest structural challenge we've had on business since I've been um, running the company for com- coming up 17, 18 years now. Uh, and I think that probably is across the board, unless you're in the medical profession or you're doing particular things, but obviously they came incredibly busy, so they, they went the other way. But um, I, I think, yeah, it's been... Um, I, I think um, looking back at it now, which is always kind of nice to do, the first lockdown was probably the biggest challenge that we we had. Um, we're kind of seeing all of our clients really just pulling out, um, projects stopping, uh, pausing. Obviously, we weren't able to deliver anything on site. We weren't able to really get anything um, either to, 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 to site. So we had this kind of... Uh, I suppose fundamental thing of looking for the first time in my life that the business actually potentially not being around in two or three months as it were no fault of, uh, of our own but I think that's probably common across many many people's businesses particularly in things like catering and uh, that sort of side mm-hmm. and um, you know obviously that must have been quite scary for you it's something that you'd, you'd grown over so many years something you'd put so much sort of love and, and time into and obviously having has, you know built such a great reputation over that as well having to look that sort of pitfall just the, the scariness of it um, you know was that something that you had to sort of stand up and get your staff to uh, to believe in the project was it something that you were you know able to do did you have to change yourself really mm. Yeah, I think I mean, that's, that's a really, really good point because I, I think we were finding every day was new information coming from the government, having to rethink the strategy uh, of what to do, how to do it, trying to communicate it to the staff, trying to communicate to clients, to make sure that the staff are safe and they're happy uh, with that whole kind of work process. And the um, I, I think we were kind of slightly forward thinking in the sense that we put all of our staff home before it was actually announced to the government. And because and, I have many years ago, I worked in the IT world. I, I set up an infrastructure within the business that we can work r- remotely anywhere. Um, so actually, it was quite easy for us to do. We didn't really have any technological issues to deal with regard to the move itself. But but I think um, I think the, the point of um, I mean, um, to be very honest, I had I had a wobble in those first kind of couple of weeks of just really not knowing what to do. And I sat down with one of our marketing guys, and we were kind of talking ab- about what do we do next? Do we pull back all our costs? Do we, uh, you know, what 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 do we act, actually do? And we actually decided to um, 
up our marketing and up our activity. Um, now, in the MySouch here, we've I, I've lectured for probably the last seven years or so at Grand Designs um, uh, uh, and London Design Week and things. It's all about designing the kitchen spaces. Um, and we brought those design talks into the studio um, here, and we've been running for the last, well, probably the last five years or so, um, monthly design talks um, of ourselves doing talks, but also bringing in partners like architects and um, other designers like garden designers and those, those sorts of people or anything re- relating to the home. Now, of course, we had to stop those events um, as soon as that happened. So we had the opportunity to switch the design talks um, to uh, be weekly. Um, and we actually ended up doing that. So we had a kind of little bank of a couple of design talks that we could that we could do. But we ended up writing a new design talk every week and even though the studio was closed, we actually built up quite a f- following because in the very first lockdown, people actually took it as love it a bit like a sabbatical, really, if mm-hmm. they weren't uh, working. So they had the time and the Zoom was new and we weren't bored of it and we kind of weren't kind of having to do it all day at work. So um, it was actually quite a fun thing. We had a really good attendance and we're doing all sorts of different design talks. If you now publish onto our YouTube channel. Um, and, and that was a real learning curve from us uh, about how to uh, remain positive and motivated and, and to see that there is a real opportunity here because people are now at home, locked in the home for the first time and are really beginning to think, gosh, is this a place that I want to spend uh, all my day in? Um, mm-hmm. And they're beginning to discover structural problems within their home and the way it's working. Of course, you know, the kids were home from school. Um, so it's kind of, in one sense, it was a, perfect nightmare for, for, for us as designers because this is what we do is we look holistically at the way that people um, people live and, and uh, I think our, our, our approach to design has, has never really been about the products, it's about the kitchen units and things, although they are really important we realise it's kind of four stages to the design process and it firstly looks at the, the products itself at the very basic level and then how people want to live within that um, with, within the home. That's very practical as very aesthetic as well, the way that they want to live within that space. But there's two more spaces which I think have really come into their own. And the, the kind of third level of design we call community, which is how people reach in and out of their home. Mm-hmm. And, that, and people become so much more home-centric and focused now. It's quite an exciting space to work when people are really thinking so, so much more about the outreach aspects of their home with regard to relationships, but also regard to materials and that sort of side. And then the final part we, we talk about is the transcendence of design. And that's the feeling of how design um, is and the impact it gives to the human soul. Mm-hmm. And we all know that if we walk into a cathedral, there's a, you know, at a, pro- at a product level, it's just a piece of, of stone, it's glass, it's wood, and it's great. But actually, at a transcendent level, there's something very powerful about it. But that exists in other places like poetry, music, um, landscapes, and many, many types of things. And people have that intrinsic sense of homeliness and um, comfort when they walk into environments and spaces that they, they love because it feeds the soul and it strengthens that. And that's what I think is happening at the moment is people are in these places in their homes, really important, special places. We have this kind of hub of the home, kind of heart of the home type of phrases. But actually, it's actually, it's the, um, it, it's not just the, the heart of the home, it's the home of the heart. Mm. And that's a very big differentiation when you start to look at design and how you want to kind of plan out a space for someone. I really do think that's an important way of looking at it as well and really bringing in the people into the design process because not everybody lives the same. Not everybody wants the same things. And I, you know, it's, it's really interesting that you take that as being the major part of the process. And, you know, Keith, if people were wanting to, you know, listen to these design talks and, um, you know, find your YouTube channel, where is it? Yeah. Well, if you just go into YouTube and search the Myers touch, um, all one word, the Myers, M Y E R S touch T O U C H. Um, you would find that. But if you if you really got stuck with that, then you can go onto our website and register for future design talks that we have coming up. So, so some examples of what we've done, which is maximizing small spaces and dealing with large spaces. And they're, they're both pro- problematic. Um, we we talk about, I've uh, just done one on, our, our main one really, which is one I do at Grand Designs, is called Creating Kitchens with Light Space and Laughter, mm. which is really the whole... Um, 
uh, people get lost in the products. They are important, but you don't um, you don't start there. You start with a feeling, but it's very difficult to find designers that actually um, want to start with the feeling and actually kind of know how to sit down and draw that out of you. And it's not actually for every client either because some people are incredibly practical and they just want, I just want a practical kitchen. And then you get the other end of the scale. They say, I just want something that looks fantastic. I don't really care how it works. Well, in some senses, that's fairly easy design to be able to do that, that, that kind of spectrum. What is hard design is to make it look fantastic, but also be incredibly practical and everything in the right place. And that is a lot of skill and time to invest, which is why we charge for um, our design. Mm. Um, um, and, and because we spend a lot of time with clients in design, and partly because, I mean, the work I've done at Grand Designs and other places, I, I lectured uh, remotely. I was due to go to KBIS, which is the American um, big kitchen show over in the States, which I was due to fly out to in February, but obviously we couldn't. So it all went um, online. Um, and those type of um, uh so you, you attract a lot of people, and, and I could be designing for free till the cows come home, basically. So, <laughs> so one um, one does um, kind of put that difference and really try to help understand there's an investment from the client of their time and effort. And to be honest, with you, the type of kitchen we we are in the luxury market, so we're kind of forty, fifty thousand pounds plus, um, and it's not a lot of money for some people, but it is some skin in the game. Yes. Um, with those type of people, it's not really the money, it's the time. Mm, yeah. The time is more important sometimes than the money. It pays our, our cost of creating something um, and it filters out, you know, some people. But actually, very, very busy people um, that are, you know, fairly comfortably off or perhaps even wealthy, um, time is the issue to invest and to think through their project in a way that they may not have considered before. And therefore, there is this kind of education process that we have to go through and educate our clients mm. um, how to work with us um, to get the best out of their project. Um, and it's been a really interesting journey for us because we stumbled into it by accident, um, as it were, because we, we were just learning, um, you know, the, the, the kind of game. But now when you, when you have designed from a transcendent viewpoint, when someone walks into their kitchen space, it energizes them in such a powerful way that we've got testimonials now from people that are just so impacted by the space that's been created. But it's a lot of work to get there, um, and it takes that that process, which is fun um, to be able to do, but is a journey to um, you know uh, to have that space that um, is worth the investment that you want to make. Absolutely, some really good points there. I can imagine that. Um you know, for, for a lot of people, it is the time that is the, the most pressing factor on yeah. uh, on what they can do. And um, yeah. yeah, that's a, it's a great way that you've, you've, you've seen that in, and you've adapted to it. But, um, you know, coming back on to sort of the pressures of the last period, but also personal yeah. growth and, um, you know, how you yourself have grown from talking to business leaders across the country, it seems that there have been two sort of camps when it comes to how people have led through this period. One has been making sure mm. that staff have been put first, that there's been support, there's been help with yeah. sort of mental health and, uh, you know, recognising the fact that this is has been a very pressurised situation and sort of rising to it. But the other yeah. has been that, you know, the business comes first. Without the business, there is no job. Without the business, there is no livelihood for a lot of people. And, you know, some have seen that as being a little bit more hard line, but also the priority. And, you know, it'd be really interesting to sort of get your take on where you've sort of grown and how yeah. you fit into this and whether you think one or the other or, or both. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it is both. Um, I, I think it's perhaps at different times um, certain things are are important. I mean, from a from a staffing point of view, I mean, we're, we're a small company. There's ten of us here, um, uh, and and it's, it's a nice group of people. Um, fundamentally, the Myers touch is only good as the people that we employ, um, and their well being, their motivation, their enthusiasm for the job, their care for our clients is ultimately what is what brings in the money at the end of the day, you know, from a business point of view. If you don't have that, I, I used to work for a multinational company and I've always had the, the philosophy of if you do the right thing by the client, you, you look after them, you care for them, the money will arrive. I, if you follow the money only, 
then you can do very well on that. Um, but for me personally, it, it's a very thin way of working and it's not um, the way that I want to do. I mean, fortunately, I mean, very interestingly for us, just on that side, is we did uh, pursue that approach of looking after our, our staff. And, and last year, we had our best financial year ever. So um, that's probably partly the market demand, but also the, the approach that we we take is we do want to care for our clients. Now, it's, it's increasingly more difficult not to care for them, but to, you know, the, the issues at the moment in the marketplace with regards to supply and lead times and those sorts of things, staff uh, sh- shortages and all those issues are, are mean it's hard work to pull that together behind the scenes. We're still trying to deliver a quality outcome to the client. So, so, so I think we've we've invested. Um, we have medical insurance here, which has mental health cover in there. We've gone for quite a premium version of it, mm. which was all available to our staff. And the actual the company that, that do that um, cover provided quite a lot of um, health related and welfare related support to that. Um, some of the things we did internally was in the first lockdown. Um, obviously, we weren't allowed to have any of the staff working, but they could be there for training or team meetings. So mm-hmm. we were able to do um, a, we did a weekly Friday afternoon at four o'clock, um, whole team meeting. Um, and it was really us just keeping people a little bit up to date on what was happening business-wise, um, not not particularly for very long, but more about finding out what they were doing, um, what, what they've been up to, obviously trying to keep them motivated, inspired, still engaged. Um, and trying to be, keep some connection between the team. Mm. And I think that was probably um, trying to maintain connection, um, well, trying to yeah, not lose it too much. But actually, when people came back, it, it did take some time for people to reconnect in that. So I think that's been quite a challenging time for us. Mm. Um, I think since since then, well, so when we came, because we had some staff off for six weeks on furlough, and then that, our, our last staff came back after three months. So um, we haven't gone back on fellow after since because we've been too busy. And actually, we've recruited more staff since then um, as, as well to kind of deal with demand. Um, but I think there's been um, some, um, I mean, I still have got to say this, but really that the government support on the furlough and our rates and those sorts of things has been fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the loans that they're able to give us, which I've never tapped into, which is great, but it, it's still there in case, you know, because we're not out of this year. Um, Without that support, it would have really been a much more difficult ride um, if we'd actually made it because it has been um, fantastic um, uh, during that um, that time. And I think probably quite a lot of businesses um, would say that it's always nice to have more, but um, we have to pay it back, don't we? So let's be happy with what we have. Absolutely. And, um, you know, obviously the fact that you run this company alongside your wife, who is a yeah. well-recognized you know, business person in her own right, um, you know, did yeah. you find that that was helpful for you having that support there somebody that you could turn to or did you both turn to sort of outside sources other business leaders to find out how they were getting on and they were working was it you know you you, you yep. needed to every business leader across the country every business owner across the country needed to to stand up at certain points and just make sure that they were okay as well um that they were able to have a plan and still support others and that was very difficult um did you find that that yep. was you know, somebody to bounce off and, and, and somebody to work alongside, you know, very well. Yeah. I mean, one of the, I mean, they say opposites attract and that's definitely the case with us. We're complete opposites, not just in our um, personalities and styles and, and, and skills, but the way we approach business. Um, and she, she brings fundamentally um, uh, what I don't have or my weak points. And, and I do that for the other way around. So the collaborative nature of what we do is actually critical to, what we've done is so we've we've journeyed this together and we've supported each other through it and you know we've gone through the real difficult decisions of kind of what is it we do and uh, and how do we do it and um, you know trying to to deal with supply issues or whatever it kind of needs to needs needs to be but that aside we've we've actually um, um, I think there was this well there probably still is a lot of people took a lot of business type of things online so there has been. A phenomenal amount of um, online stuff. Uh, we've worked with Action Coach for uh, probably about four years, um, which was um, so we had our, obviously our own coach, but Brad Sugars, who leads Action Coach in the US, he put a lot of video stuff out and ended up doing kind of daily kind of podcasts and little kind of talks and updates about pivoting your business. And, mm. and some of it was really, really helpful um, to be able to do that. I've got a few friends 
of who are in business is not quite the same as mine, but struggling with the same sort of issues and staff working from home and how and how do we work that through? So that's been quite good. Um, so so I think um, I think I've I've watched some of these things and I've I've listened to some really fantastic speakers, but there is a point you get to after, particularly um, in the first lot lockdown side when we were on Zoom a lot you really don't want to be on Zoom at the end of, of, of a working day or you're too busy during the working day to do too much of this sort of thing. So you've got to really select and pick and choose. But I have found some really interesting um, and helpful uh, people that, you know, inspire you. I mean, like Simon Sinek and people like that, so, you know, they're, they're well-known people that mm. do those sorts of things. And, and, and they're not, they're not so well, um, well, well-known in, in that process. Um, I think we've invested quite a lot in in training. We 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 run a program here called Life Languages, which is a psychometrically profiling system around um, uh, communication styles that we all have, and the seven communication styles that everybody has. And we use it as part of our recruitment process, but we also use it as part of our team building. Mm. So when the team came back, we actually brought um, uh, them in, and we did a, a one day training course um, with the um, with with the team, they they all done their profile, so they know what their profile was. Um, and and once they'd done that, they then had one to ones with the consultants about um, unpacking their own profile and how it would interact with the rest of the team. So that that we found really really helpful because there is times in our business where it gets quite stressful and where things don't happen to plan. And um, we're in kind of in the construction industry in that sense, although we are designers. It's not necessarily the most organized industry around. Um, having come from the IT world, I think that's generally a more organized type of environment, mm-hmm. particularly when you're doing you know, more mission critical type of things. Buildings generally aren't mission critical in the same, the same way that a um, uh, server for financial yep. services company might be, for example. Um, so, um, so it's kind of that whole kind of catch up. So it can be quite tricky and, and it, it gives us a fantastic way to be able to sit down and if, if stress is happening, we go through the profile, we try and work out what is happening and uh, and it's very helpful for people to understand. And then once these flags are kind of have risen up, uh, we then we then there's answers of how to counter them and, and how to how to work it through. And sometimes they're they're rightfully stressed about something because we need to change a process or we need to change a system or we need to do something. And, and that's, we're very much, um, so we kind of laugh sometimes. The only thing that's constant is change is kind of one of the things that we, yes. we, we do. We're constantly wanting to improve. Um, and we're trying, I suppose, trying to deliver a service, which is, um, uh, is, is excellent. It's the best that we can, we can be. We don't always get it right. And we're learning that as well. So, um, but we'll change processes, we'll change systems, we'll change whatever we need to do. We'll change the supply if we have to, to, um, get, uh, get the experience right for our clients. It really does seem that you do take a, a huge amount of sort of self-reflection and both in yourself and across the company, uh, making sure that everything is, is moving forwards and, and can be as good as, as can be. And that's, you know, a good sign and a great sign of, of good quality leadership and, and business running really. So, you know, very much uh, well done on that score, you. Um, you know, making sure that everything is, is continuously moving forwards. And, and speaking of, of sort of moving forwards, um, the next 12 months obviously are going to be uncertain. There is still a lot of uh, this pandemic to go. There's going to be governmental changes. As you say, the support that has been there is going to be slowly yeah. withdrawn and companies are going to have to stand again on their own two yeah. feet. And so how do you sort of see um, you know, your own journey and the company journey going for the next 12 months back to normal or continuing to be, to be busy? Mm. Well, I'm hoping continue to be busy. I mean, our our pipeline is is very very good at the moment. We have some fantastic projects uh, coming up. I mean, realistically, we have a we, we I mean, we, we're really looking at fitting now from April next year. Um, and, and I think there's a number of reasons. There's some suppliers now on 18 week lead time for appliances. If you want certain ovens or dishwashers or whatever, uh, and I think um, the the old days of um, we're coming into September. You wander into a, a studio and you um, you want it fitted for Christmas. Well, that is possible at some levels of the market. Um, I'm sure people that are stocked up with things or, or just doing more kind of entry level type of 
products, but at our level, that's just not going to happen. It's not possible at the moment to to do that. And I think um, people with projects on or in the middle of projects need to really consider the impact of lead times right now. Um, um, and we're working with with projects. Um, yeah, I mean that's other thing. We're booked up now to yeah. April next year with 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 work. Um, um, so that all sounds you know very interesting when it comes to you know people personally um, you know sort of looking ahead, uh, making sure that they are not expecting good quality design overnight. Um, that's not going to be yeah. the way it works anymore. Um, but also, you know, do you think that you're now in a good position to continue with the um, the design talks, being able to get back to yeah. full? Um, um, uh, you know, modes of operation. Do you think that, um, you know, everybody is going to be getting back to normal and the supply chains can cope really? Mm. Well, it'd be, it'd be very interesting um, to see. I mean, obviously the HGV issue, which is the most cu- current one at the moment is, is um, uh, I mean, it's not directly affecting us. Uh, it's obviously affecting us in some ways because obviously we're buying off suppliers and if they can't get things, um, I think that's um, a challenge. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, to be honest with you, I'm kind of quite excited about the next uh, time. Um, and I think the reason why is that when, um, I, I suppose you, you have this situation where when, a, when a, a major catastrophic problem hits something, which is what COVID has been for UK PLC really, is you, you kind of run away from it, you bury your head in the sand or you confront it. It's okay, this is an opportunity to now really think about what we do, the way we do it, the way we approach and can we make it better? Do we need to change what we do? Do we need to invest? So I'm constantly in this um, process of innovating the whole time. Um, and I've just brought a member of staff in to help innovate some of our internal systems and processes to be able to get them to be more efficient um, and more uh, accurate. Um, obviously, we work in a very precision type of industry at our mm level. So um, to be able to do that, we're just investing in a new infrastructure system, which has given us a new kind of workflow management system, which is all bespoke to us as a company, um, which will make things more efficient for us as we as we do that sort of thing. We're then uh, thinking and innovating about how do we get um, the message out to clients that we don't really do kitchens, we change people's lives, we create environments for people to flourish and to re- relationships to be strengthened. Uh, but people just see us as, as a kitchen company. So we're constantly innovating and rethinking that whole process. And I like that, actually. Um, I don't like stuck in the mud type things, um, you know, doing what we've always done because we've always done it. That's just not my personality, which can be a bit of a nightmare for the team here because I'm constantly innovating and they're saying, hang on, we haven't done the last thing that you just said. We need to finish that first. And so I've kind of, I suppose I've matured in the years. That's probably what I did in the the early days of keeping the team on board but it keeps them inspired and I think um, I think um, being inspired to come to work so the whole kind of aspect of planning something trying to um, work out ways of, of improving yourself making you stand out from the crowd in the marketplace is probably one of the biggest things at the moment because lots of people do kitchens and lots of people do kitchens really really well and why us if you know at the end of the day so we have to get that message and you touched on the design talks and that's been a fantastic way for us to get our message out to people. Um, so that to inspire not just clients, but also the staff in what they do, because we're only good, like I said, of the designs we produce and the quality of the, the d- delivery that we do. So keeping them motivated and um, going, I mean, for example, during um, uh, lockdown, we um, obviously we could meet together as a whole team because that was, we're a work bubble um, effectively. Um, and uh, we had a team meeting, um, and we normally have a few nibbles around the table, but I just brought a chef in who's a friend of mine. Um, he came in, and he just cooked and prepared uh, food for us, and we had a, we had supper together after, after, after the meeting with a private chef, which was just a really lovely thing to reward the team and just to re-strengthen some of the kind of the bonds and things, but doing little things like that to um, be able to do it. And, and then I think the aspect of, I think one thing that I've noticed we've had to be on top of our money a lot more um, mm. over the last 18 months, um, particularly as we are wanting to expand and grow the business more. So we've um, brought an accountant in, which has helped us, um, you know, a new kind of on staff rather than subcontracted, um, which is helping us to get all those systems in place to, to innovate something that um, 
has substance and structure to it that is robust um, and and works. And then just keeping that kind of inspiring thing because that, that we have quite an inspiring job. We have a great job actually. When it goes really well, it's a fantastic job because you take this horrible space that someone has that they always uh, apologise for when you go in to see them, um, and then you you see it in a completely different way. You innovate something and you take clients on a journey and they trust you and they spend a lot of money with you sometimes and they give you a lot of money and they give you a lot of trust to give you an outcome um, that they'll be excited about. And when that happens, the look and the experience that you you have with a client is just lovely. It's one of the most exciting things that I think we actually do when they get shocked by something. And we had one lady once when we we were driving to see some friends and we hadn't seen the project finished. So I said, look, can we drop in on the Sunday? And she said, oh, we'll come for breakfast. So we, we came for breakfast. And when she walked into the room, she was actually jumping up and down on the spot. This is a lady in her kind of late 50s, jumping up and down on the spot with excitement of how lovely her kitchen was. Well, now, that is, that's not putting boxes in rooms. <laughs> no, absolutely. That sounds, you know, as you say, just inspiring people, inspiring, um, you know, design, inspiring staff and, you know, having those flashes of inspiration yourself. And I think that there is a, a great place to sort of end the conversation for the moment. So it'll be great to have you back on in, you know, a few months once we've got through oh. the next stage of, of the awesome <laughs> and we're looking Thank ahead you. into sort of Q1 of, of 2022. And, you know, we can speak in a yeah. little bit more detail about what your next plans are and um, what you've come up with and what the staff are, are struggling to to get done behind you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Keith, yeah, thank you well, thank so you very much, much for, time, for coming on. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, that's great. It's, it's been a Pleasure to join you and I look forward to joining you again next year with that invitation. Thank you. Fantastic. That was Keith from uh, the Myers Touch. Up next on the Leaders Council podcast, we have our chairman, Lord David Blunkett. He will be giving his take on the experiences of the last 18 months, as well as his thoughts on the political and economic challenges to come. He will be interviewed by Matthew O'Neill. Lord Blunkett, welcome. Thank you very much. It's very good to be with you. Um, well, of course, uh, nothing is being said uh, at the moment other than COVID-19, uh, which uh, we must touch on. Um, what would your message be to small businesses who are trying to keep going? Well, I think the last ones standing will be the ones that thrive when we get back to some sort of normality. So it's have confidence and courage Obviously, take advantage as far as you can of the government help. I think that Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, has gone about as far as you could have expected mm -hmm. in the circumstances. There are obviously small businesses that fall between the cracks. Those who uh, don't have um, defined premises, can't benefit from the business rate waiver, uh, have not really been able to demonstrate that they can uh, adhere to the PAYE for furloughing staff and, of course, whether they can receive the, the grant, 10000 or 25000 all, all of those who can uh, are obviously able at least to benefit from that for the time being and look to the future. But I think the second thing to say, and they don't need me to tell them this as a politician who, who did want to do a business studies qualification, which is that it will be a different world and being able mm. to think about how that world will look in a year's time and be creative about it and learn from not just what's happening to you at this moment in time, but to others around you and the sector that you're working in, that will be really important. Do you feel that the long-term uh, effects of uh, the COVID-19 outbreak uh, will in some ways be positive uh, for British industry? Well, only in the sense that people are having to be creative, they're having to adjust and innovate Therefore, they're thinking about more productive, if you like, greater productivity ways of delivering the same service or delivering the same products. And in that sense, I think we'll have temporarily at least very much higher unemployment than we've become used to. But we'll probably have a burst of productivity, mm -hmm. which will help with the recovery whether it will help with the inequity of the way in which our economy is imbalanced, both between services and product productivity and, and uh, production of goods and services, I'm not sure. 
what we will need to try and do is to ensure that the geographic imbalance that exists is, as far as humanly possible, is dealt with by both uh, the entrepreneurship and innovation from the bottom up and targeted government help, which will still be needed. And we are now in the throes of the kind of borrowing that we saw back in 2008 to save the banking and economic system. We're, we're having to do that to save the whole of our productive business and mm -hmm. commerce. And I think that will have to be sustained for some time. Do you feel that people will take a second look at global supply chains in the wake of this outbreak? I think there's going to be much more creative ways of using local supply and linking up inside sectors much more effectively. And I hope that the Leaders' Council will be able to play a part in that in the sense that people who mm. have something in common, a synergy in terms of what they're delivering, whether it's a service or whether it's manufacturing or whatever, uh, will be able to see that there's a, a, a good outcome from n knowing the sector better, linking with people, not just geographically locally, but those in this country who may not have been on the radar in terms of what they produced for the supply chain. And, of course, um, ensuring, because there's quite a lot of fraud going on as we speak with um, people getting into cyber attacks, that they'll also take account of going into the, the cyber security side effectively as well. The more we are online, the more people who are working from home, the more vulnerable those businesses and their supply chain become. And that's something to think about as well. How important is strong leadership at the moment? Well, I actually think that it's brought to the fore leadership in a whole range of areas from Obviously, government itself, and there's been ups and downs with the Prime Minister's uh, severe illness, but all the way through the public and private sector, people have, to use the jargon, stepped up. And they've shown uh, local, regional, national level the kind of leadership that Britain historically was very good at. Regrettably, we've not seen, seen the same on the international scene for mm. all kinds of reasons, uh, but maybe we will in future. So I think out of this will come experience of people who have seen an opportunity to do good as well as seen an opportunity to provide a good uh, a service or goods, uh, including, for instance, shortages uh, for the health and social care uh, system, um, the food chain and the like, uh, but also I think in terms of seeing the, the synergy between the private and the voluntary sector and using people's uh, commitment to each other in a very positive way. I, I'm not sentimental about this. Things will revert, mm -hmm. but actually I think there is a, a kind of moment of moral judgment of people feeling that they've got a role to play outside the immediate survival that they're engaged in. And if we can hang on to a little bit of that social responsibility, that will be a very positive outcome. Absolutely. Now, what's your broad view of how the government is responding to this? Are you broadly supportive of their measures? Well, it may surprise people to hear that, that I have been very supportive. Of course, there's been legitimate criticisms about the speed of response on protective equipment and on issues relating to testing. But my own view is very similar to the challenge that was made to the Prime Minister of Italy when people said, why didn't you close Italy down faster? And he said, a fortnight before we did it, I would have been considered to be a madman and nobody would have agreed to do it mm. if I'd tried to move too quickly. And I, I think that's something that we need to reflect on here in the UK. We, we may have seen the signals elsewhere uh, across the world and taking them more seriously at the time. Hindsight is a wonderful thing, but as someone who's uh, had his life in uh, the opposite uh, political party to the, the present government, I think that with some hiccups and mistakes, they've not done a bad job in what has been incredibly difficult circumstances. And you're absolutely right. In a, in a liberal uh, democracy that we live in, it's, it's very difficult for people to swallow orders given to them from government. Um, well, the, the UK and um, 
and the US, and to some extent to the Scandinavian countries, have a very different interest, uh, history and, and therefore interest in maintaining the freedom to decide and the persuasion and mm. consent that's required. Uh, those countries that have experienced one way or another totalitarianism over the last century have a slightly different way of coming at this. Mm. I don't want to exaggerate it, but I think that that's why getting the balance right of getting people to go along with what you want them to do in their interests as well as the nation as a whole is a sensible proportional balance. And I think we now need to adjust to the coming out of the crisis gradually, uh, readjusting to recovery uh, in the same way. Now, something you've mentioned recently on this balance is uh, the police overreach and the enforcement of the COVID-19 uh, structures that have been put in place. What have they done right, and where have they gone too far? Well, I think that they were interpreting what was not necessarily as clear yeah. advice as it might have been for all kinds of reasons, because people were feeling their way. I think what's come out of it has been uh, a demonstration by local police services in some parts of the country that they could get people to do what was needed without the heavy hand of drones overhead mm. or people being told that they you know, shouldn't be walking in the street because this was all about self-isolation, not incarceration. It was about getting people not to pass the infection on to each other and therefore to provide distance rather than to make our lives a misery. Those police services that adopted that policing by consent and chipping people along did really well. Those who went over the top, I think, soon got a very substantial pushback. And one of the strengths of our democracy is that you could have that debate. People could say, I'm terribly sorry, we, we think the police force in our area has gone over the top. And that in itself is a constraint and uh, a readjustment. That, that's another strength of um, living in a country where you can have opinions and express them without actually being thought to be a fool. Now, of course, uh, the government has faced criticism uh, that they were slow to react, uh, and Boris Johnson wasn't present at the early COVID-19 COBRA meetings. Now, uh, Number 10 has claimed that this is normal practice. Uh, the health secretary often chairs COBRA meetings uh, related to health. Uh, does this tally with your experience as a secretary of state, or would you have expected the PM uh, to be more hands-on during the initial stages? I think different prime ministers do have a very different style. And Boris's style, which I think will now be considerably adjusted, was very swashbuckling. In some senses, delegating is a good thing, uh, as every leader of every business or public service knows. Those who try to pull too much into themselves end up with a massive bottleneck, uh, great uh, failure of trust and the inability of people to show what they're worth and to, to demonstrate their capability. So I, I, I'd be very wary of jumping in and saying he was wrong to delegate the essential COBRA meetings. What I was surprised about was that he didn't um, chair the first couple because mm -hmm. my experience with Tony Blair for the eight years I was in cabinet was that Tony was a great delegator, but he would get a grip to begin with, watch what the difficulties were, and then give people direction and confidence to be able to get on with it. So looking back, I think Boris himself probably thinks, God, I wish I'd spotted the signals from elsewhere in the world more rapidly, and I'd just been there. However, this also raises another issue. All of us in positions of leadership need good teams around us. Mm -hmm. I think after this is over, he will be assessing those who really did step up and those who demonstrated their inadequacy. I think we'll probably end up in a year's time with a much stronger cabinet than we have today. Well, absolutely. And of course, uh, we've seen a, a significant uh, drop in the visibility of uh, certain special advisors like Dominic Cummings uh, during this uh, entire period. So it'd be interesting to see how that pans out. Um, well, yeah. it's certainly readjusted the role of those behind the scenes with those who should be taking the decisions having received advice. Obviously, there's been a complete transformation in the profile of 
experts, if I might use that term, who'd previously been denigrated, mm -hmm. scientists, medics, people with behavioral science uh, understanding. My only criticism was, were we getting wide enough advice? Were we narrowing it too much to a couple of key centers in London? But that's because I've always been adverse to everything being London-centric. I think there's great expertise, wisdom, experience out in the sticks, and uh, we should use it. Uh, rightly so. Um, now, was part, pandemic planning part of your time as a minister, particularly perhaps uh, when you were Home Secretary? Well, it was, but it was on the back of risk arising out of counter-terrorism measures. Right. Uh, I was the Home Secretary for three months when the attack took place in September 2001 on the World Trade Center and beyond. But we did an enormous amount of uh, scenario planning, both desktop and, and real. On the back of that, it was very heavily orientated to future developing terrorism risk. I certainly got involved with talking about pandemics. I remember being at a seminar in Edinburgh where the university there had done a lot of work itself on the issue of pandemics. And of course, we, we saw SARS and other things emerging. I, I think it would, people have criticized the government for not picking up the report from 2015, five years ago. I think that what happens is human nature kicks in you deal with what you're immediately faced with. Mm. You, you, can, you can sponsor reports. This is true of business planning, of course, as well, and scenario planning for what business continuity will look like, recovery plans for business, what will happen if um, there's a cyber attack, what happens if there's an energy sh cut, uh, shut down. Um, these kind of things you, you can look at, but you're immediately turning your eyes to what's in front of you. And had we picked up a bit more on the danger from Ebola and SARS and what have you in the past, then we might have said, what if something hits us in the developed nations that we don't have a vaccine for, mm -hmm. that we can't immediately whisk up uh, protective materials or equipment or, for that matter, medicines that help with recovery, all of which we now see are a danger. I think this will make an enormous difference to the planning for the for the years ahead. I hope it will be widened so that we don't just look at what's happened, because very rarely do you see something exactly repeat itself. Some of the circumstances will be, but others won't. So that's why I've put emphasis in what I talk about on looking at the other virus, the cyber attack uh, scenario, mm -hmm. which could be just as dangerous in a, uh, a world of just-in-time provision. One of the miracles of uh, the modern developed world, except for the very poor, has been the distribution of food. A lot of it on computerized, uh, technologically advanced systems. If that were to come down, we'd be in real trouble. So I think we need to think those sort of scenarios as well. So have a full plan across uh, both sectors, uh, biological warfare, pandemics, and uh, cyber warfare. Yes, and to do so on different levels, I think again, thinking of thinking global but acting local, we mm. need a lot more to think about what would happen if something took shape that actually broke down those national and global chains and how we would cope and without uh, obviously we've got enough fear and anxiety to last a lifetime without uh, creating even more anxiety we can think about those things for the future in a more rational way i think now aside from the physical uh, threat of the virus one of the things that people are vastly worried about is the effect on uh, the economy not just national economy but also the world economy um, now, it, it has been said by certain parties, um, and uh, I'd like to garner your uh, thoughts on this. Is there a danger of the effects of the lockdown being even worse than those of the virus? Were it be prolonged, I fear that that balance would tip the other way. It is about proportionality. It is about balance. It's the wisdom of Solomon, really, to 
to get the moment right when you start to move and then to move quickly. There's no doubt whatsoever that we are stocking up, not just on the economic and employment front, which will be devastating enough, but on the health and social well-being front, enormous challenges. And they will need careful handling because there's a lot of people whose lives, for a variety of reasons, are at risk in the future on a scale that we've been dealing with over the, the immediate handling of the pandemic, concentrating really hard on those affected by COVID-19, those sadly who have died or been seriously incapacitated, that will roll over into the economic, the social, the mental health and cultural well-being of the nation. And that will need all of us to pull together as well. Absolutely. Now, do you believe the government's doing enough for business? I think that the speed of reaction once the scale of the pandemic was clear was very good. I've praised Ricky Sunak for his action. Uh, Remember, a chancellor who had only just come into office was planning to deliver the budget in the middle of March and has had three, at least three equivalent budgets since. I think he's handled it very well, understandably worried now about what we're doing to our economy. The level of borrowing is sustainable because of low interest rates, but it reaches a point, of course, where it, it tips over so that you can't then do the kind of structural investment requirements that the government were laying out before and in the March budget. And those will have their consequences as well as a planned payback over many years. I think we've learned something over the last few months. We, we needed to take immediate action. We don't want another round of austerity equivalent from 2010 through to 2019, I don't think the nation, on the back of what's happened and the challenges we have, could take that. And therefore, we need a different plan, economic plan, over a much longer period, just as we did from the Second World War all the way through to 2002, when the final American loans were paid off. Now, of course, uh, one thing that's on everyone's lips, um, how much longer do you believe uh, that the lockdown can go on for? I believe that we need to be substantially back in action as an economy in June. This obviously is led in terms of places where people would meet in large numbers, having to uh, adjust to the fact that it will be longer for them. And sadly, that will involve business closures. It's why the Chancellor extended the furlough scheme to the end of June. Mm -hmm. But unless we, we get things moving in June, I think we'll run into the summer where all kinds of services and industries will have a chain reaction effect. And what happens with one will then have a major impact on another. And then you get the skittle effect where things get knocked down that you hadn't perceived were going to be affected. So I very much... If I were in government, and I always think of things in that context, what would I do if I were in government? I would be on the side from the second week in May, on the side of the hawks in terms of saying we've got to start moving and we've got to do so with the collaboration and cooperation of the public who have got the message, who did behave, who responded magnificently. Let's try and get back, perhaps you know, doing things differently for a time but substantially getting back to business as usual. Unless we do that, then those areas that can't and wouldn't expect to be back in action immediately get pushed further into the middle of the year and the autumn, and then they become unsustainable. Now, of course, um, one of the other major developments we've had recently are uh, the changes in the, uh, the Labour Party. So if we could just uh, speak on the Labour Party for uh, a while... Um, this might sound like uh, an obvious question, but uh, how does uh, Secure uh, differ from Mr. Corbyn? 
Well, I'm biased because I believe the Labour Party um, has come out of four and a half years of a black hole of a nightmare mm. uh, where it neither represented a, a, a credible opposition nor a, an electable government. And the combination was to let those who supported the Labour Party and needed some of its policies uh, let them down very badly. Sir Keir Starmer both is a highly intelligent a uh, professional lawyer who, as director of public prosecutions, led the service well, uh, had to take difficult decisions at a time of austerity, understands the world beyond Labour members, but has been able to do business with those who originally supported Jeremy Corbyn mm -hmm. and was able to command support from them. His creation of a balanced shadow ministerial team has been very encouraging. Um, I, I supported Lisa Nandy, who he's made shadow foreign secretary, because I thought she understood the north of England and um, the, uh, the disaffected uh, Labour, former Labour voters. But I believe that Sakir has taken on board those who have something really sensible to offer. And I believe he will be both a, a great leader of the opposition. More importantly, he will then present himself as a credible alternative prime minister. And all governments need an alternative government at their shoulder. Mm. Uh, it was true of us from 97, and it took the Conservatives some time to recover and to get to that position, but they did. And the Labour Party will, and that's crucial for our democracy. All of us need to understand and appreciate that a living, breathing, functioning democracy requires uh, a credible, confident, and uh, in many ways uh, supportable opposition, as well as a government that we clearly want to do well, because none of us want, as we didn't with the COVID crisis, none of us want the government to fail. We want to see our economy recover. We want our social well-being to be taken into account. We want to overcome deep-seated inequality and poverty, and we want to do it with enterprise and entrepreneurship and business playing their role, and that is about leadership nationally, locally, in the private and the public sector, people with ideas, with confidence, with the ability to pull teams around them, above all, to have some idea of what it is they want to achieve and a very good idea as to how to achieve it. Now, of course, one of the biggest problems Sakir is facing will be tackling the party's anti-Semitism problem. Uh, there has been a recent internal report that has been quite damning. Uh, what's your response uh, to that report, and what does Sakir need to do in response? Well, there are two reports. One which is being produced by the Quality and Human Rights Commission uh, which he will, and has already indicated, will implement in full. The second was a leaked report put together by the supporters of Jeremy Corbyn, 800 pages of private uh, interchanges on social media, which he has, uh, Mr. Keir Starmer, set up an investigation to identify uh, who did it, who leaked it, what the content was, does it have any salience and lessons for us and where necessary action will be taken. So I hope that as he moved very quickly to reassure the Jewish community, so he will be able to take the necessary steps to back up that reassurance with the kind of actions that says that this was a blight on a historic great political party that all of us, all of us were ashamed of. We've been able to put that behind us and to move on to facing the future with confidence. What's the one king, uh, key thing that Sakir needs to do to restore Labour as an election-winning party? I think Sakir Starmer's major challenge is to convince sceptical voters that Labour has not only reverted to a party that they can support because they can see it acting developing, presenting as a credible alternative government, mm -hmm. but also 
that the lessons have been learned from the fiasco from 2015 onwards. In other words, there have to be very clear signals of substantial change, not just the right words, not just reassurance that we're not uh, going back to some of the crazier uh, policies, but actually that we've understood why the electorate rejected those policies so substantially in December 2019. If people get that message, they'll understand that the Labour Party has changed as it did in the 1980s and early 90s to become the electable government with the greatest majority in historic majority, even greater than 1945, which I was privileged to be able to take advantage of in 1997 when I joined the cabinet. Now, I know what your answer is going to be to this question, but uh, indulge me. Um, do you think Secure has what it takes to be PM? Yes, I do. I think he has the background, he has the experience, he has the professionalism, he has the forensic uh, mindset, and he has the confidence to have put a team around him which will ensure that it will work. And those elements are true of all leaders. Ideas, the ability to build a team, to have confidence in that team, uh, and to be able to demonstrate leadership in practice, sometimes at the most difficult times. And, you know, the Leaders' Council, those sharing their thoughts with uh, uh, the kind of thing that we're doing now uh, with uh, a podcast, but also joining us in linking up in that network of people who can support and help each other and learn from mm -hmm. each other, that is what needs to be done in politics as it needs to be done in business. Thank well, you very much indeed, Matthew. Well, really thank you for coming on the, uh, the program. It's been a, an absolute pleasure, and I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you very much, and good luck to all those listening in what has been a nightmare scenario. Good luck for the future. Have courage have confidence, and yes, listen to those who know more about business than I ever will. Thank you, Lord Blunkett. Thank you.